let's focus on uh, what really is the rise within their story and today we thought we're going to discuss uh, Lupin as a company. So before that, uh, let's just focus on how the Indian pharmaceutical sector per se has actually panned out and what's really been the growth story in the last decade or five years or so that uh, one has actually mapped and what's kind of growth story or stock momentum that we have seen okay that's the indian pharma company growth that you've seen since 2003 to now and that's been a good 17 percent CAGR return that we have seen in the entire industry per se now what about individual companies then uh, that's the healthcare index from start of 2001 Till about 2009, you had a 16% annualized return in the index. And ever since then, you've seen a big spike up. It's a good 32% annual return that the index itself has given you, Tanvir. Yeah, and you know, uh, let's just look at uh, the breakup of how business revenues have shaped up. So 40% of annual ANDA approvals are from India. 33% of Indian company sales are coming in from the United States. So, you know, the mother market really matters. And with all the US FDA issues, that was the impact that we were seeing um, in terms of sentiment for the sector. Because, you know, with the US FDA being tough on regulations, uh, the business that was at risk was almost 33% of the total sales for Indian pharma companies. 40% of US generic volume is supplied by India. 31 acquisitions for US generic companies have happened over the course of the last few years. So it becomes even more critical uh, to talk to S. Ramesh, uh, CFO Lupin, who joins us in the studios, uh, to talk about the rise with India potential that Indian Pharma has that we've seen thus far. Um, Ramesh, it's, um, it's hit a speed breaker uh, and a solid one at that, something that's really stalled things for a while with the US FDA relations. But, and of course, you know, the expectation that, you know, the US economy would be putting curbs on pricing. Uh, do you see things clearing up? Because I think about a few months back when we spoke earlier, you had said that, uh, you know, the clouds are clearing and things are back on track or seemingly coming back on track. Okay, let me amplify this. Firstly, thank you for having me on. Uh, but it's a very interesting question that you're asking. Uh, what is it that is actually stalling Indian Pharma right now? But let's take a f the stock of the situation currently. We talk about America, there has been channel consolidation in the light. It has been happening for several years now. Uh, it, um, but, um, you know, so it has actually accelerated the, you know, the price erosion, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, you know, about a couple of years ago, it was close to about 14%, double digits. It's yeah. come down to single digit numbers. Uh, there is a fresh wave of consolidation expected next year with Express Scripts and Econdesk coming together. Uh, that could actually, you know, trigger again another, uh, you know, price erosion uh, move again. Um, the second part of it is uh, there has been a lot of spotlight on, in fact, pharma prices in America. You know, and that, to that extent, uh, uh, that would be true with, in fact, ethical pharma, where prices have increased to, you know, by uh, at least about 300% over time over the last 10 years, whilst in the case of generics, it's come down over time. Um, the third part is essentially because the, num the products going off patent itself, you know, the number of products that you're re-engineering from India has also come down. Yeah. Uh, that's for America, so to speak. You know, if we talk about uh, and, the num and the intensity of competition is, of course, you know, contributing. There are a lot of players from India, smaller players from India, also joining the bandwagon in America. Uh, if we talk about India itself, you know, there's an ever, uh, you know, ex expanding list of NLEM, so to speak, products under NLEM. So price control is uh, is is in vogue. Um, a larger number of products and higher number, of, and, and to that extent, uh, it is certainly contributing to this. You know, this timing of the situation itself. Um, there's too much a focus on affordability and not so much on awareness of medicine, accessibility to med of medicine, and availability of medicine. Mm. Um, then, of course, if you talk about other markets, you know, what has been doing good for us is the fact that, uh, you know, uh, garments all over are talking about affordability of medicine, and to that extent, generic medicine was the, the order of the day. It was the case in Japan, it was the case in most of the parts of the world. Those factors are still true, but those are smaller markets. They really don't uh, move the needle so much. Um, so what has actually brought us here till date is certainly not going to take us forward, you know, hence, you know, going forward. Uh, and I always believe that uh, there's no such thing as a sustainable competitive advantage. You need to constantly reinvent yourself. And that's so when it comes to the pricing pressure, how do you think you can reorganize your strategy in, able, in order to be able to deal with something like pricing pressure in the U.S., which is a reality. And like you said, that's the, that's the norm now across the globe. 
I, exactly, that's exactly what I was trying to amplify. Yeah. So we need to move on to reinvent your strategies and move on to something else. The answer lies in getting into, uh, into more complex generics where the intensity of competition is going to be lower, getting into speciality. But it's not going to be an easy thing. You know, there's of course um, generic medicine which will stay and that's going to be the mainstay. About 60% of our total you know, turnover would certainly come. And if we talk about the bigger companies, that's the way it is. Uh, but having said that, I think the three things that one should be focusing on is complex generics, speciality, and m and And I'll amplify each of those. Uh, when you talk about complex generics, it also calls for, you know, it's something which is much more difficult uh, to, to bring in. It calls for, because the, the level of uncertainty there could be higher. The risk is certainly higher. It calls for deeper pockets. It calls for very different skill sets and so on. Mm -hmm. There are several molecules which have still not been, you know, cracked, you know, and uh, which could, you know, and that is one market that you're looking at. The second, the second is speciality. And speciality would mean anything that you call on specialists, you know. Um, and that calls for a very different kind of uh, skill set also. It calls for deeper pockets. Uh, it calls for, in fact, uh, legitimacy with the doctors. You get to own that space. That's an extremely important thing. And that's where, in fact, your m and strategy kind of dovetails into your organic strategy itself. Mm -hmm. Uh, because with m and comes, in fact, legitimacy because you can buy something to, of, and you have that uh, connect with the doctors. Yeah. The second is you are able to sustain, in fact, uh, either the pipeline or the skill sets. The skill sets would be very important, that is ability to kind of, uh, you know, uh, configure unmet demand and mm. look at, in fact, uh, you know, skill sets to, to meet that. Uh, and that uh, clinical trials would become extremely important and again raises the level of uncertainty in the market. Mm. Uh, m and becomes important because uh, you, know, you need to identify you know, opportunities where you can and, scale. And establishing that legitimacy itself. Yeah. That again calls for deeper pockets. Is that the reason why, uh, Ramesh, your uh, R&D spend has constantly gone up from 7.5% of sales to 13.5% of sales? And are we going to be looking at more focus on researching where the next opportunities would lie, given the paradigm shift that we are seeing in the pharma industry globally, for you to be able to, you know, change with the change? As uh, you, you, what you're saying is absolutely true. So we're looking at, in fact, uh, more spends on fact speciality, you know. Uh, that calls for a lot of clinical trials, as I was just explaining. And mm. clinical trials would actually mean the level of uncertainty also goes up. You know, a trial could cost anything between $6 million sometimes to as much as $60 million. It really depends on the molecule itself. We speak about biosimilars, for example, it generally costs between 40 to $60 million. So how much can this percentage go up by, uh, you know, in, 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 from a three-year perspective? How much are you looking at spending more uh, in R&D? And how do you balance off that investment? I would see it as an investment because it's, you know, at the end of the day, you're trying to, you know, uh, bring in returns on that. Uh, how would that balance out in terms of profitability? I mean, where would you be able to safeguard your margins as pricing continues to be If you can take a cue from, in fact, a big farmer, you know, they generally spend about 18%. But the level of uncertainty associated with that is much higher. Mm -hmm. But if you do come across one blockbuster, it certainly, you know, offsets all that expenditure spend, so to speak. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the level of uncertainty here is certainly much lower when you're dealing with, in fact, complex generics and the like, because it's still a product which is there in the market. It's a question of your technical ability to crack it, clinical trials and deeper pockets and all of that. There are ways of actually mitigating that, for sure. Okay. You need better skill sets. More importantly, can you look at in fact uh, R&D financing where you're able to park a part of your the risk with somebody else uh, and, and share in the benefits also and that's the way forward for Indian Pharma and this is being done by uh, you know by bigger companies as well. But are you saying yours will go up till 18% as well? I'm not saying it's gonna go to 18% I think we'll cap it around 13% okay. uh, but that said that's one of the ways of actually going about it. Mm. You've always maintained that the US business will not be a driver for growth but in FY19 you expect growth to bounce back strongly what convinces you about this? I, I don't think we said that FY19 is going to be the growth year. I, we said okay. essentially it could be 20. Okay. Uh, okay. 19 Later. is going to be a lackluster year again because as I said, you know, we do have products for the next year. We do expect products like Renvela, Renego, you know, mm -hmm. Belcall to come through. Uh, there are quite a few products in our pipeline. If you look at our own pipeline, for example, and I'm here spe specific about Lupin, um, we've got at least 200 products to go in the next three to four years. So the pipeline is there. It's a question of unleashing our, our pipeline. Mm. You know, and uh, Gidufa has actually made things easier for us because uh, it, it's a double-edged sword in some ways. Mm. Uh, it brings in greater competition at the same time. It expedites approvals itself. And that means our launch period could actually be much faster. And that's, uh, we expect that to happen from the second part of 19 and uh, from 20 onwards. Mm. You know, talking about that, analysts have said that the ramp up in Gavis has been slower than anticipation. Would you say the 
same? Would you concur with that uh, thought? It is. That's the reality, really. Mm. You know, it's because of two things. You know, so uh, if you look at the mainstay of, in fact, Gavis products, it's actually controlled uh, substances. And controlled substances are something which actually depends on, in fact, releases by quota releases by the government itself. And that takes its, you know, it's a, you need to have, uh, you know, clear orders and a track record before you actually can get more releases from the government. The second part of the story is because of manufacturing in America itself, you know, it was on ramp up mode and we kind of underestimated the problems associated with uh, taking up the capacities out there. Uh, those problems are behind us and to our mind, uh, you know, we're at least one year behind, in fact, our uh, expected, uh, you know, uh, uh, projections for, uh, for America, for, from Gavis itself. So, so there's been a year's delay and um, we are well on, uh, you know, we are on track to take this forward. Tell us how the relationship with the US FDA has evolved. Uh, I believe, uh, you know, Goa and Indore are still uh, trying to uh, complete compliance. So what's the status on that? And I'll, I'll give you the context of this question. Uh, we uh, pretty much on a daily basis talk about how pharma has underperformed. A sector which gave a 32% annual uh, return over the course of the last eight years is has, you know, hit a roadblock. Um, and so the question is, given where valuations are, is there a turnaround in the works? Uh, is the pressure of getting supplies from India making the US FDA say, look, there is a cost bias over here, so let's fix this relationship that we have with companies? And is that translating into more clearances coming through? So talk about yourself and talk about the sector as well. If okay, you I'll talk about in fact, um, Goa and um, Pitampur. Um, for sure, you know, we are expecting, in fact, clearances. We don't expect, in fact, the issues to be escalated. And we do think that uh, Goa would get resolved, you know, uh, in the, in the shortest time frame possible. Uh, we are expecting it any time. Mm -hmm. And that's it, the case with uh, Pitampur also. I think the 483 is a more or less in the same bucket really. And we're fairly confident that uh, you know, our uh, explanations have been accepted by the FDA. So to the extent I don't think there is going to be any problem in terms of escalation. When you talk about FDA itself, you know, let me tell you an anecdotal thing. We have a facility in, uh, at New Jersey in, in America. And um, more often than not, it's the same set of inspectors who actually call on there, and it's a Joe or a Bill and over a cup of coffee you discuss the issue and so on. Uh, so there's always a context to it uh, when it comes to America. When it mm -hmm. comes to India, you know, it's a different team that calls on in these facilities and to that extent their interpretation, you know, uh, the entire context is very different, you know, so you go through a very different agenda and all of that, mm -hmm. you know. I'm not saying they're very objective, they're very, you know, uh, it's, it's a regulatory thing which we respect tremendously mm -hmm. uh, and they're dispassionate and they're very objective in the way they go about it. Mm -hmm. But there are of course interpretation issues and so on. So it's actually a collaborative effort that actually is called for. But is that second, changing, Ramesh? Is that, that's uh, it is a lot more stringent than ever before. Uh, they would like uh, to, you know, look at a, a digitized record rather than actually, you know, um, uh, and that paper I think records, is paper yeah. records and all of that. And I think India, uh, Indian Pharma is also evolving, moving on to, in fact, uh, you know, to uh, data acquisition yeah. systems, which actually embeds the data on uh, in digital form, look at e-batch records, you know, logbooks which are actually kept in, uh, on digital form and all of that. But it's, as I said, it's a journey, it's a continuous journey, you know. And I think Indian Pharma will certainly rise to that. So. How long before we get back to those kind of CAGA returns like our beautiful graph showed us? When do you think the healthcare index is going to give those kind of staggering returns of 36%? Next five years from now, when I, we would still be sitting and interviewing <laughs> you, uh, do you think uh, it would be that kind of a phenomenal rise? It could be very sure. This is, this is an evergreen industry because it's, yeah. it concerns health. You know, and as with everything else, you find a lot of disruption in this industry also. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the main, you know, healthcare is indeed a very important industry. It's the second largest employer in India after the construction sector. Yeah. So you can imagine it's, it's, it's and so important. And you believe the clouds are clearing? The clouds are there, uh, but we do see, you know, a lot of optimism there for the future. So give me a number, 32% annual return from 2010 to now 2015. Do you think that kind of return is possible? From 2021 onwards, I would think that uh, at least there will be normalcy. Uh, but certainly, the future looks pretty bright to me. Okay. Yes, uh, the future does look bright. And Ramesh, we can't thank you enough for coming here, being a part of our uh, Rise with India CEO Speak uh, segment, uh, really putting things in context and saying that, look, We've had a bad patch, but it's all getting sorted out. Uh, their own uh, facilities are going to get clearance soon from the FDA. And the relationship with the FDA, which actually spiraled the entire sector into a, a downtrend, is improving. We really appreciate your thoughts. Thank you very hands. much. My pleasure. Thank you very much.